You may be seated this morning. I am going back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to do a little bit of a review today. It's been about three weeks since we... So I'm going to go back and address some of the things we've already looked at. Uh, uh, just, just let me, before we even begin, uh, we, uh, the Bible tells us in, in 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. Or, and you, when you carefully read that scripture, you see that he's talking about a coming judgment, the day of the Lord. And, uh, and it's gonna, what it's going to do is it's going to catch our world unaware. Okay, in fact, one of the examples that stands out to me is you'll find it in Matthew, uh, where Jesus talks also about the coming of the Lord. And again, this is a reference to judgment and his coming to set up his kingdom on, on the earth and that type of thing. And uh, he says they knew not until the flood came and, and took them. And, and so there, there is a, our world is unaware of what's happening. Okay, but as a believer, there ought to be a quickening, not just... Because we, we discuss Bible events, uh, we, we look at the events of our world and we try to compare them and come to an understanding of how they fit in with biblical prophecy. And, uh, but it, it's, it's good, I, there's nothing wrong with that. But I can do that and still not have a spiritual awareness of what I need to do. In the Old Testament, there were the uh, when, when David, he had been the king of Judah for seven years. And there was a lot of turmoil in the nation. There, were, there was competing forces. Uh, uh, the Some were following the son of Saul, one of the sons, ones of, the sons of Saul. Uh, this is when you had Abner and those guys, and they're, just, they're trying to, uh, to keep a kingdom that is tottering because the real king is the king over Judah. And then you'll read in the scripture where they finally, the whole, whole nation of Israel is united under David. During that period of time, there's always intrigue and there's always things going on that, uh, you know, you, you just, you, you got to learn how to handle yourself. And it talks about the sons of Issachar. And the sons of Issachar, they, they knew the times. And, and the Bible says they knew what to do during those times. And and so you and I as believers, this is where we have to be. We have to know what to do. We have to be aware. Amen. If you would go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. Again, I'm just going to uh, review. And so we'll, we'll try to add. Uh, Paul says, and he's writing to Timothy, and he says, but know this. Okay. In other words, Timothy, you need to know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Okay, now, so it uses that terminology, last days, okay? And last days from what? Is, it, is, it, is this just the last days, or, or is this a period of time, okay? And as you study the Scripture, you realize that when he talks about the last days, it actually begins with the coming of Jesus Christ, okay? In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, it, uh, verse 1, he, let's, let's go to verse 1. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, okay? And we have that, don't we? You can go to the Old Testament, you can read the warnings, the preaching, the encouragement, uh, the promises that God gives us through the prophets. So God spoke to the world through the prophets. But he says, but in, in these last days, he's spoken to us by the Son. All right? And so when we start talking about the last day, we're talking about the time when Jesus was born, when Jesus began his ministry. And, uh, and actually, so when you try to define these last days, it simply is God completing his purpose for his people. That's the last days. Well, we're in that time when God 
is completing his purpose for his people. We're in those last days. Hallelujah. Now, one of the things that we, we confront, and all of us confront this, is 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. Is, again, Peter writes this, knowing this, so both of them talk about the fact we need to understand some things. Knowing this, first, he says that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust. Uh, again, so the Word of God warns us that there are going to be those that scoff. You know, where is the promise of His coming, is what they will say. And, and, the, and the world, it remains as it was, which is not true. My father used to use the analogy of the frog uh, put in a cold pan of water, you know, and then put it on the stove. And you turn the heat up gradually. And the frog doesn't jump out and the frog ends up being boiled to death. But you take that same frog and you, and you put it into a boiling pot of water and it, it's hopping out as quick as it can, if, if it can at all. Amen. And so uh, there's... A, there's in our world, the pressure has not been turned up bang, but it's been a gradual heating. A gradual heating. And in that kind of a world spiritually, we may not be aware. Amen. And this is why we've got to pray. We've got to have a relationship with our God because, you know, I know they had the movie Coming as a Thief in the Night. And it, they have the, you know, not knowing uh, the rapture and it catches the, the, the believers completely by surprise. I, I don't believe that today. He's coming as a thief in the night in judgment to a world that's unaware. But to a believer, we may not know that. We may not know exactly the hour. But we sure can know the season. We can understand and be aware that the coming of our Lord is nigh. Hallelujah. And, and, and the, what's used in the scripture is, amen, we know now that we are in the fall, don't we? I know what was it this week, uh, uh, fall officially begin. But man, we, we begin to see the signs of fall. The, the sun doesn't stay up as long. And, and the leaves start falling from the trees. And, and, and it gets a little cooler in the evenings. And, you know, and uh, some people love this. And you start to smell... The, the, the burning leaves, you know, and it, all these are signs of the season we're in. Well, ladies and gentlemen, amen, I believe that believers can know the signs or the seasons and be aware of the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, now during these last days, there, uh, there have been seasons, okay, or times, Amen. Where people believe the Lord was going to come. And, and I believe there were things going on that could be an indication. Uh, years ago, I had in, in some of my study, I, there was an old, I read a home Bible study that was really, it had like 200 and some lessons in it. And one of the lessons was on the, the, uh, the Antichrist and, and the false prophet. And in this lesson, it, it had named Hitler as the Antichrist and, and the false prophet of Mussolini. Now, I'm looking back at this period of time, so I obviously whoever put this Bible study together didn't have it. But there were indications, you see. Amen. And that's, again, that's another subject. You've got to be careful what you say. Don't be emphatic about everything that you see going on in our world and say, yeah, this is how it's going to be. Uh, I, I tell people, they ask me questions, I say, do you see G-O-D on my forehead? And I've never, and if somebody ever says yes, I'm going to be scared to death. I've never had anybody say yes. They've always said no. What am I saying? In other words, I don't know all the events. I don't understand everything that's going on. Okay. I am not God. But as a child of God, filled with the Spirit of God, having an understanding of His Word, I can tell you that Jesus is soon to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, as we read in, in, in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we, we, we come to an understanding as Paul 
addresses Timothy. He says, but you've got to know this, son, that there are going to be perilous times. Amen. That word perilous means dangerous, hard to deal with, savage. Okay? Anybody still leave their house unlocked? No? If I leave it unlocked, it's a completely by mistake. And all, it's the mercies of God. I had a pizza man come to my house last night. Uh, he wasn't coming to bring me pizza, ladies and gentlemen. He, and, he, and the only way I knew that he was at my house is he, he tripped coming up my porch. And I heard all kinds of racket out there. And I'm saying, man, what's going on? I, I thought at first it was my wife who was in the bedroom, maybe in the closet. And they said, no, I don't think that's what it is. And so I, I went to the front door and opened it, and I see this guy, he's walking away. And, and when I opened the door, he said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, and so he had come on my porch, and he had fallen, and, uh, and it, he wanted to know the address. It actually, it was just right next door. He missed it by one house. But he, didn't, he also missed a step on my porch, too. <laughs> poor guy, poor young guy. He took a fall. Amen. And, uh, and so, well, where am I going with this anyways, man? I'm getting caught up in this story of falling on the porch. Oh, yeah, locking the house. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you know, we just, we just locked the house because, because our time is not sure. You know, even driving down the street anymore, you're, you're not sure. And there's areas that you, you're careful in. And, uh, I mean, you can go down to Chicago if you want to. I ain't going down and driving on the expressways in Chicago. There's some crackpot out there with a gun shooting at people. My God, what's wrong with that? It's because of the time we live in. We, you, you know, you read about Sandy Hook, the, 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 the grade school. I mean, uh, the horrible things that, I mean, and then you see it just almost weekly. We're seeing some place, uh, whether it be a business or a school or a college or, I mean, where somebody just shooting at somebody. And, and let, let me just say, it, the problem is not the guns. The problem is the evil that's in the heart of people. Didn't have a gun, they'd use a baseball bat or a knife. You know, but it's, it's, there's, this is a dangerous, hard to deal with, savage time. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to warn you today the pressure is going to be turned up on the church. Amen. We're meeting now, and it's great that we can get together. But you know what? The day may come that everything you give as an offering and a tithe to this church will not be able to count. Amen. For tax write-off. Amen. The day could come that we will lose our nonprofit status. That could happen easily in the world that we live in. And, and then we're going to find out exactly where we're at in that deal of why we give to God, and et cetera, et cetera. But it's a dangerous, hard to deal with, savage time. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28. And again, we use this scripture, and I, I'm just... Again, just reviewing and hope to be able to continue this next week. Matthew records the event where Jesus is in uh, Genesis, or what we call the Gadarenes. And in most of your Gospels, it only talks about one of these demoniacs. This is where the man has a thousand demons, or six thousand demons. And the Bible says he is met by two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs. And then it says they were exceedingly fierce. That word fierce there is the same word that Paul uses perilous in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. And again, it means dangerous and hard to deal with, savage. Amen. And, and it's so much so that this verse says that no one could pass that way. Oh, brothers and sisters, we got to pray. We got to seek our God. We got to have our day covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. From the top of our head to the sole of our feet. Our babies, we got to pray that God would cover them, amen, with his precious blood. Amen. You, why? Because the day that we're living in. I, I, this is not a political type thing, but, amen, I, I, in my time, I have seen our police force go from Mr. Friendly to being much more active and much more militaristic in its approach to situations. Why? Because of what's happening in our world. Amen. And it's, it, Mr. Friendly just ain't working. And America doesn't have it right. 
They're not calling on God. Amen. They're not asking God. They're not repenting and saying, God, we want to turn to you. They're just going on and, and it's, you know, just doing what they've been doing. I don't care how many laws you write. A law will never change the heart of a man. Only Jesus can. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Amen. Again, Paul writes to Timothy and he says the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. Some are going to depart from faith. They ain't going to stay in this thing. You know, how do you measure another believer? How do you measure yourself? How do you do that? Well, of course, with the Word of God. Yes, sir. Amen. Be aware of where your brother and sister is around you. Not, it's not as it seems to you. Some, some have expressed a dismay, when some, a dismay when somebody is no longer with us. But the dismay came because you did not see the decline. You did not see the spiritual dropping and falling away that begin long before they ever walked out the door not to come back. We need to pray that God would deal with the heart. But the latter time is going to be like this. People are going to depart from the faith. Uh, why are they going to depart? Giving heed to what? To deceiving spirits and the doctrines or the teachings of demons. demons. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So here we are. We understand that there's a change. We understand that if believers are not careful, amen, you, you got to keep your attitude right. S S Sister Brian, you, you have a, a greenhouse at your place, don't you? I want you to know that them tomatoes, that you, they're they ugly. Your tomatoes is ugly. But they're the best tomatoes I ever ever ate. <laughs> and I'd take good eating tomatoes over purdy. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, they go good with bacon. A BLT. Man. Whoa, baby. Amen. Meaty. Okay, I got it. But, but here's, here's why I'm saying all this stuff. You don't go out into that greenhouse you know, once or twice a year. Do a little watering. And, you know, you, you, you're out there every day, aren't you? Hey, you? You treat those plants like they're, they're your babies, don't you? Yeah. I don't even, do you talk to them? He, you talk to them. Okay. Cool. Let me. Brother Randy has learned a lot from this same kind of work because he's been doing somewhat the same thing. And he has learned that you've got to keep tending the plant. And, and you've got a constant fight with weeds, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort, amen, to bring about, amen, that end result. I'm, I'm, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying, and with walking with God, it's not an accident. You must do things by choice. You must do things by choice. You choose to go out in that garden every day, and you choose to Take off those, what do you call those parts of the tomato plant, the, the brand, the, not the, the suckers. Yeah, get them things off because they ain't going to produce nothing. Amen. And, and, and again, brothers and sisters, amen, understand the most valuable thing you can do is anything for the kingdom of God. It's more valuable than your job. Let me just be as bold to say this. If your job is destroying you spiritually, then get rid of your job. Well, easy for you to say, preacher. I know exactly what I'm saying. Because I've done that. I got rid of a job. Because the only time I ever got in church was once every 13 days. And then when I came midweek, I was so exhausted Amen. I only got an average of four hours of sleep a night. And I was so exhausted that I could come up here and lead the songs and worship God. And when I sat down on those 
on that pew it was like I had a button on my seat. And I'd tell myself, you ain't falling asleep tonight. And so help me, I'd wake up to the giggles of my wife and my kids and, you know, and, and they didn't know they irritated me, but, but, but it, you know, it, 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 got, it got to the point that my children were learning to read, okay, and so I can't leave this on my wife. I got to do my part. So we'd sit down on the couch and they'd start reading to me. And notice I said sit down on the couch. I did the same thing at home. I fell asleep. I'd wake up to dad, dad, dad. What, 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 what. You know, and they've been trying to read and I was gone. It was destroying me spiritually. I, I found myself being very easily angered. Okay, I just, well, I don't know how far we're going to get today. But I, I remember one time, this, I'm, tall, I'm talking about myself now. I remember one time, amen, going to pick up my wife. She worked at Woodstock, the, their nursing home. And so I pull into the front there where they're supposed to only be the drop-off for patients and that kind of thing. And, and I'm sitting there, and, she, and she's supposed to be out, and she's probably in there gabbing and talking to somebody, and I'm waiting, you know. And, and all of a sudden, somebody just hits the back of my car. I see a car behind me. Okay, let's see his problem. Okay. And, uh, you know, first time's an accident. The second time wasn't an accident. The third time wasn't an accident. And that was the last time. Because I was out of my car, and, and I, believe it or not, I didn't look like that. I was a nice, strong 250. And I, I could take six cases of soda up the stairs. Okay. Yeah, I'd be out of breath by the time I got up there, but have you ever carried six cases of soda at one time in your hands? I did that just to get, get the work done. But uh, I was standing at his window, inviting him to come outside and have a discussion with me. And my kids are in the back seat of the car watching me. Because now I'm not, I'm not swearing, but I'm close to it. Why don't you come out outside? You got a problem with me? He never rolled the window down. And uh, so I went back to my car, embarrassed with myself, and drove around and coming back in hiding, and then she came out. And, and I realized that spiritually, I was at a low. All right? And I had to do something. I, I couldn't just let it go and just keep on. And so... The day came that I was offered a job that was Monday through Friday, and you know, and I still had to get up early, but I got home a lot earlier, and, and uh, I took it. And I worked two weeks for this company I was working for, and that whole two weeks, the guy was trying to sell me on stand. And he told me, well, in October, Mark, you're going to get a $50 raise. And I thought to myself, I don't even want to work for you, chump. Because he, he was not a good boss. Now, I didn't, I didn't say it verbally to him, but that's what I thought. And uh, I got out of there. I don't know what would have happened if I had continued to live like I was living. Well, were you out going out drinking and smoking? No. But I was not praying. And I was struggling. And I was not coming together with the people of God where I was in a worship atmosphere. I'd work Sundays and I'd get here on a Sunday morning about the time they was all walking out the door. Amen. I'd come right from work and I'd still have my uniform on. As I, yeah, okay, I've said a lot about it. Now, here's the deal. Your spiritual, amen, relationship with God, your salvation is worth more than anything else. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that if I'd have continued on, that was going to not only impact me, but my wife and my three kids. I, I, I fully understand and believe today that how I live impacts my children. All right? I really do. Ladies and gentlemen, amen.
how I live impacts my kids. And so, I'm trying to live for God. I, I don't have anybody living in my home other than my wife, so it's just me and her. Amen. But i got grandkids now, so I, I, I'm not laying down my responsibility. I am not laying down my responsibility. Amen. I want my grandkids to know God. Amen. One of the most thrilling times for me was when my grandson Bradley would get up. He'd get, he's an early riser. And we'd be sitting out in the kitchen at 7 o'clock in the morning having a Bible study. Those were precious moments to me. He, a young fella, 13 years old, almost 14, he wanted to know something. We were in the book of Samuel. So we just talked about Samuel because that's what they were teaching at home. Hallelujah. Are, are you still with me this morning? And so we're living in a day when we have to, you understand, ladies, you've got a battle to be spiritual. Y'all hear me? you got a battle to be spiritual. This is a war. And you got a battle to be spiritual. you got a battle to be close to God. Amen. And, and there's a lot of things that they may be important, but nothing is as important as my relationship with my God. Nothing. Hallelujah. All right, now, I guess I've said enough in that area. So there is a greater intensity and a deeper evil today than, than I've ever known in my lifetime. And my society is accepting it, embracing it, and, and espousing it. Amen. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to point out from this chapter, and these are things I actually said last time, but we're trying to get somewhere today. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. Paul gave some instructions to obey, to obey in these perilous times, these last days. All right? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. He talks about a form of godliness that denies the power. And here's what he tells him. From such people, turn away. So here's what we have to do. It's just one. I got three. He gives us three instructions in this chapter. I got to turn away from the faults. Everybody say it. Turn away from the faults. I got to turn away from the faults. Not everything is truth. You can't base truth on how nice a person is. All right? Some people do that. Well, they're good people. That's not the basis of truth. Truth is not based upon whether somebody is good or not. It's based upon the Word of God. Hallelujah. Truth is not based upon the fact that they even go to church. Okay? It's not based on that. It's based on the Word of God. Do you, do you understand that in the Scripture, much is said about false prophets. Much is said about false teachers in the New Testament. Much is said about it. Jesus warns about it in the 7th the chapter of of Matthew, when he just gets done talking about, amen, the straight way and the narrow way and then the broad way that leads to destruction and, and few that find the narrow way and many that go into the broad way. And in verse 15 he says this, he says, beware of false prophets. You see, many are following false prophets. And Paul says, follow those who are true. On his last trip, where he stops outside of Ephesus, amen, or he stops over in Rome, excuse me, outside of Rome. I think it's at three taverns, if I remember right. And, he, and they come and they're weeping because, amen, they, they want to spend time with him and he's just passing through. He talks to them about the fact that 
that savage wolves are going to come in and they're not going to spare the flock. Now he's not talking about four-footed beasts. He's talking about those coming in against the sheep of God's pasture. Amen. And, and they come to destroy the flock. Well, how do you destroy the flock? Amen. With false doctrine. So, we must turn away from the faults. You know, if you would go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. I just, you understand God does miracles. He does miracles. He's going to continue to do miracles. I heard reports, amen, this week of people being raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Blind eyes being opened and people walking when God works. All right, but, but the Bible, see, just in connection with what we're reading in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul talks to the Thessalonians and says, there's a coming of the lawless one, which is the Antichrist, okay? Amen. John is the only one that ever refers to him as the Antichrist. And he refers to him in the epistle of John. Amen. And the word anti in the Greek means instead of or against. So instead of Christ, there's going to be this Christ that claims to be Christ. Amen. And he's really against the true Christ. And the Bible warns that. Amen. But when he comes, this lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all powers and signs and lying wonders. So if you base truth solely upon even a healing, you can get distracted. The validity of the truth is based upon the Word of God. Amen. Go down to the next verse, verse 10. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, and how are they going to perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. What's your safeguard? A love of truth. I want miracles. I want the supernatural of God. But I also want to have a love of truth. And so... Paul tells Timothy, you got to turn away from that which is false. You can't be involved in that which is false. Amen. I've had people use this argument. Well, I'm just going to go be with them because I'm going to help them to come to understanding. Well, how many people do I know right now who have used that argument that said, I'm just going to go be with them because I want to help them to have an understanding? How many people... Do I remember that have ever, amen, came back or infected somebody and, and they, be, they became uh, uh, like, like, like those that teach truth? I don't remember one. I'm, I'm going to tell you what happens. They're good folks. They're nice folks. So your voice becomes quiet. And it's really not bad what they're saying. You know, and, and, and so there's that gradual lessening of a, of a position of truth until anything becomes acceptable. And again, it doesn't happen overnight. How do you affect people? By speaking the truth in love. Wherever we go, whoever we're with, with, we cannot take the position, well, I'm just going to hang out with them, just be with them. Uh, you know, they're, they're good folks. You mean you must always speak the truth in love. I'm going to tell you what happens when you start speaking truth, even in love, with some folks. They don't want you around anymore. They'll label you. When they see you coming, oh my God, here they come again. I can't handle this. You know. So we've got to turn away from that which is false. I, I've got a message to preach this morning, and it's heavy on my heart. And I'm, I'm just, you know, I could really connect it with what I'm saying right now, but I, but I cannot. Uh, just let me say this. Is if all you ever want in a service is to be made to feel good, if all you ever want to do is just jam, dump, Jump and shout and dance and amen. Your, your relationship with God is pretty shallow. 
When, when I read the Word of God, it, it tells me, in fact, it is in this same chapter, verse 16, it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, and for correction, and for reproof, and instruction. And the, in other words, as a pastor, it's not my job to make you all feel good every Sunday. What it is my job to do is to help us all to get close to God. Amen. And to examine ourselves. And if all you got is that entertainment, feel good mentality. Okay. You ain't going to be saved. Because the devil's really good at feel good mentality. You remember what what it says in Hebrews chapter 11 when it came time for Moses to figure out am I an Israelite or am I an Egyptian and the Bible says he chooses the reproach of Christ over the pleasures of sin for a season because he sees far 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 beyond the huts that are that are uh, that his families are living in so sin is pleasurable. And by the way, I just want to use one moment. Second Corinthians chapter eleven, uh, about verse uh, thirteen. Let's see what happens there. And and I'm just I'm shooting from the hip right now. And sometimes I don't exactly hit the target. But I'm trying to. Ah, there it is. My God, thank you, Lord. All right. You see it in your honor. So Paul writes, so Paul writes, and he, he tells us, from such, for such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. You hear what it says? Not everybody is an apostle. In fact, I'll probably mention this this morning as I preach in the second, second chapter of Revelation. Amen. The, the church at Ephesus, they, they knew the difference between a real prophet and an apostle of God than a false. And they examined, and they found them, it says they're to be liars. And uh, so they're out there. They're transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Next verse, verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. You understand why we need to turn away from that which is false? Because not everything that's packaged out there is true. I don't care how pretty the package. I don't care what kind of great deal it is. And if you do not have a love for truth, you're going to be deceived. All right, let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm about ready to wrap it up today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, so we're to turn away from that which is false. And again, we're gonna, we'll get into this later. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14. So I, I turn away from that which is false, but look what it says in verse 14. But I must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. It's all connected. You know, if you're just into following somebody, you don't know nothing about them, that's very foolish. So I turn away from the faults, and I follow those who are true. Continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. This is what he's, in these last days, this is what, this is what, Paul is instructing Timothy, turn away from the faults, follow those who are true, and then verse 14, amen, verse 14. Is that where we were at? I'm sorry. Let me back you up to verse 10. I don't know. I'm sorry. Verse 10. We'll come back to verse 14. Okay. He says to, Paul says to Timothy, but you have carefully followed my doctrine. A man of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance. In other words, he saw Paul outside of the pulpit. 
He saw Paul out there rubbing shoulders with people. Amen. And this is where follow those who are true. And the last one, verse number 14, and I got it. I'm sorry. I hope I'm not confusing you here. Amen. But you must continue. We must continue in God's Word. So in these last days, from the instruction of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, we know we got to turn away from that which is false. We know we got to follow those who are true. And we got to continue in God's Word. Let's stand this morning in this room. It's good to see everybody here. Hallelujah. Let's just reach out to God and ask God to help us. Help me, Jesus. Help me to walk with you. Serve you, God. Live for you, God, in these last days. Help me, God. Turn away from that which is false. Follow that which is true. Continue in your word, God. My God, bless your people today. Strengthen them, we pray, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.